You're joking, aren't you? It's the Teesside Chef. <laughs> hey, I'm in Paris in that there French France. No, 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 no stereotypical French music. I, I hate it when they do that. Turn it off, turn it off. And here I am on the Champs Elysees, or Champs Elysees as we like to call it on Teesside. And I'm sure I've cracked that one before. And why am I here on the Champs Elysees? Well, I've come to Pierre Hermes shop at number 86 to check out what are supposed to be the best macarons in the world. And I didn't know that people from Teesside were allowed onto the Champs Elysees, but here I am. 18 flavours here to tickle the taste buds and a bit of a pilgrimage for me as I'm a right macaron enthusiast. And I'm going to be unboxing this box of all 18 flavours later on in the video, so make sure you stick around for that. And I'll also tell you about my 15 minute argument on the Place de la Concorde moments after shooting this segment if you're lucky. But first, let's get in the kitchen and I'll show you my easy to make at home chocolate macarons recipe. And I'm doing two batches here for reasons that will become clear. But for one batch, you need to start with 75 grams of ground almonds and get the ones without the skins if you can. And add 90 grams of powdered sugar to that in a blender, of course, because we need to pummel these two together to ensure our macarons are as smooth as a Frenchman's chat up lines. And I don't suppose you really need to do this if you don't have a blender, but all the macaron pedants do this. So we better add as well, eh? Because we want to fit in, don't we? And it always is best to scrape around the bowl to make sure you get an even mix before blitzing again here. And even if you've gone rogue and haven't blitzed your almonds and sugar together, you definitely do need to at least sieve them together here. I mean, come on, eh? Make a bit of an effort for me here, eh? Show me a bit of can-do attitude. And now that the mix is nicely blended, I'm going to add one teaspoon of chocolate powder here, even though I should have already done that to save me having to whisk this all together to combine it. Putting more cacao in at this stage will make your shells darker and more chocolatey, of course, but you'll probably find that when these are baked, more of them will crack on top. And that just goes to show how delicate this recipe can be, so you've really got to stick to this recipe, eh? Don't try and make it all individual and stuff. Putting your own spin on it and not thinking that you're all clever. Anyway, I'm covering these dry ingredients now with cling film, because any moisture at all is not your friend when you're making these. If it's a hot, humid day, for example, just go do something else with your time is my advice. So now our dry ingredients are tucked away safely. We can beat 60 grams of room temperature egg whites slowly at first. We don't want to beat any large air bubbles into these egg whites while we're doing this because we're just a bunch of absolute idiots if we do that, to be honest, to be fair. And we're not idiots, are we? I mean, we're all proper clever and that, so we have to exercise a bit of patience here. And after about a million years, our egg whites will start to froth at the mouth like I did on the Place de la Concorde. And that's when we can add our caster sugar, 60 grams of caster sugar here, and add it slowly, a tablespoon at a time, and wait each time until the sugar has had a chance to dissolve before adding another. And once all of our caster sugar is in, and we've made sure none of it's sticking to the sides, we're well on the way here now, so we can speed up the mixer and carry on beating the eggs. Now you don't want to let your egg whites get too stiff here, you want to beat them to what's called the beak stage, where the egg whites look like a little bird's beak as they hang off the mixer blade. And I'm going to go in and gather some of this egg white up so we have a fair representation of the texture. And as I lift it up, you can see that little beak there. Let's see if we can get the camera into focus. There you go. And seeing as though we've kept our powder dry and we have nice beaky egg whites, we can mix them together. Add the egg whites to the dry ingredients and give them a bit of a leathering. And you don't need to be too soft with them here. Show a bit of backbone, eh? Wish I'd shown a bit more backbone on the Place de la Concorde. I nearly got a leathering as well, speaking of leathering. So I'd been on the Champs-Élysées, got the macarons, went into a park to shoot them, and then walked down to the Place de la Concorde to get the metro back to the hotel. The wife, in her eternal wisdom, was navigating with Google Maps on her phone as my hands were filled with bags of pastries, bloody screaming kids, and kiss-me-quick hats or whatever tat she'd bought in Paris tourist traps. So we get there, and we're looking for the metro station, and she completely loses her marbles and sense of direction and starts pointing her phone all around the gaff as if she's holding a tricorder on a Star Trek away team. I'm telling her after a brief look at the map that the station is on the left. She insists it's on the right, even though she's spinning around like a ballerina trying to get her bearings. I'm telling her to get two points of reference with which to navigate from, but she doesn't seem to understand this basic concept and proceeds to strip me of all my dignity 
in front of hundreds of startled tourists. So anyway, if ever you hit the Place de la Concorde, after walking down the Champs-Élysées, the inexplicably invisible and unsignposted metro station is just on the left, just like I said it was. Little tip for you there, might save you some stress. Or you could always just get a traditional map and not use a dynamic one that changes its orientation every time you change direction. Anyway, enough of all that shite, because I have to explain this really important next step to you before my blood pressure explodes again. This is the macaronage stage I'm doing now, where we finish our mixing. I'm using a pastry scraper here, and as I'm stirring it around, I'm gently pushing down on the mix to get rid of any excess air. We don't want to knock all the air out of it, but we want to get rid of the larger air bubbles. And as the mix develops, it should be glossy and it should settle in the bowl a little bit like molten lava. And I test it every now and again because what I'm looking for is a steady stream that drizzles off the scraper in one piece and doesn't break. So I'm testing it every now and again. And I'm going to give you a close up of what it's supposed to look like when it's ready. And there you can see that steady stream. I've slowed this down for you so you can have a proper look see at it. And once it's ready, we're going to gather it all up into a piping bag with a plain nozzle. Don't fill the bag too much here, though. Otherwise, you'll end up doing a dirty protest all over your own hands. And before I fill the piping bag, so that I don't get any leakage out the bottom, I'm just going to twist the bag before I put it in this cup here, which is going to help me. And it's much easier to do it this way, unless you've got three hands, like. So if you have got three hands, you don't need to go through all this rigmarole. Actually, you know, thinking about it, you'd probably need four hands to do this comfortably. Yeah, but I digress, because as you can see, I've got a piece of baking paper here now coming in, and I've drawn circles on one side to help me with the piping of the macarons here. I draw the circles to the size I want to pipe to, rather than the size I want the finished macaron shells to be. And I drew these circles about the size of a Euro 20 cent piece, but I don't know how to translate that into English. Anyway, I got 35 circles on this baking sheet, which didn't do very much for my ADHD like, because 36 would have been better, wouldn't it? And my second batch is going on this silicon mat, and the only disadvantage to using this is that it can ride up a little bit in the middle, as I pointed out there. But in any event, get them piped on, and they will be tricky to pipe if you've never done this before. They spread a lot, and the mixture doesn't really want to let go. Give them a little twist, or pull the bag away quickly as you pipe to make them play the game. But this stage might require a little practice. I mean, I've done this dozens of times and I'm still rubbish at it, if I'm completely honest. Anyway, that's the silicon mat taken care of and that's the easy bit for me. So let's try these on paper now. And even though I literally have a guide of where to pipe here, I'm still not adhering to it very well. Don't panic if you're as rubbish as me though. These will come out of the oven better than you think they will. And now we've piped all these, we have to get rid of any large air bubbles by slamming the tray down onto our work surface from a height of at least 12 inches. And make sure you warn any small children in the vicinity before you do this, because all humans are born with the inherent fear of loud noises, and there's nothing more annoying than kids bawling their heads off while you're trying to concentrate in the kitchen. I popped any remaining bubbles with a toothpick, and now perhaps my best tip when making macarons is to top them with sprinkles after piping. It looks pretty, you don't see it that often, and it will hide any imperfections on the top of your macarons. And you don't need to press these sprinkles down or anything, just let them rest on the top and they will stick properly. But in any event, after piping, you need to leave the macarons now for at least 30 minutes to dry out. You want them thoroughly dry before they go in the oven. I like to leave them a little longer than this though, maybe about 45 minutes, depending on the ambient weather conditions. I mean, you don't need to become a meteorologist to make good macarons, but a little bit of awareness of the weather conditions at the time will help you. Just make sure that you do test for dryness with the tip of your finger. If they're not sticky or tacky after the 30 to 45 minutes, then they're ready to go in the oven. 170 degrees Celsius, fan setting, that's about 340 Fahrenheit. And you want to put them in there for about 17 minutes. And while they're baking, let's go back to Paris and check out these world-class macarons I've been banging on about. So after chewing on down the Champs-Élysées, I decamped to a small park at the end of the street for this unboxing and let's bring the bag in here. Very high quality and environmentally damaging bag this one. And we're doing this on my temporary grass studio as you can see. No expense spared in the production values here let me tell you. And I've never watched an unboxing video on YouTube before 
but I know it's a thing. Just like that ASMR. But anyway, here we go, as we peel the top foil off for the reveal. And there you are. All 18 flavours. Here's the chocolate one, close up. And this was probably the best one of the lot, along with the vanilla one. Can't say the same of the wasabi and strawberry one, like. Which I ended up feeding to the pigeons, and they seemed delighted with it. I thought one of them was going to get its head ripped off at one point, and I, sh- I should have really uh, filmed that fight. But anyway, it looks like our shells are ready now, so here they are out of the oven. And I have to say, they look better than when they went in, just as I predicted. And they are perfect inside. And here are the ones on the silicon mat, and they are much more uniform, generally, in shape and size. And you'll know they're done by just jiggling them lightly on top, just like this, but obviously while they're still in the oven. And if they don't move, they're done. And I do want to give you a good old close-up of these to prove to you that they are correctly made. Lots of macaron videos won't do this, of course, because they'll be made incorrectly. If in doubt, I always like to slightly overcook them rather than undercook them, as the meringue we've worked so hard to achieve can collapse if they're not cooked properly, or the oven's not hot enough. But these look pretty good. And there's a close-up of the inside, if you don't believe me. And all they need is filling now, and this is as easy as finding the metro station at the Place de la Concorde if you let me read the map for you. Because we're just going to chop 100 grams of milk chocolate, 100 grams of dark chocolate into tiny bits, and we're essentially just making a thick chocolate ganache here. And this is an ideal recipe for a beginner, really, because this filling will hold firmly and be stable while being just soft enough to soften those shells over time and impart a ton of chocolatey flavour into them and into your gob. So I'm heating 100 millilitres of double cream on a low heat and I'm giving it a swirl to avoid getting a skin on here. Although eagle eye viewers will note that I was starting to get a bit of a skin on there. But no harm, no foul, because I'm just going to pour this cream onto the chopped chocolate. And you won't think that this tiny amount of cream would melt this chocolate so easily. But it does look, and I haven't even cheated here. And I always like to sieve the ganache at this point just to make sure it's silky smooth, and that will of course remove any skin from the cream that I of course definitely didn't allow to develop while I was distracted. And any bits of chocolate that are being as stubborn as my missus when it comes to reading a map will also be removed by this process. And then just cover it with cling film, and you can put it in the fridge until it's a pipe in consistency. And you're nearly at the end now, because these just need to be filled generously with the ganache, give them a little twist, and then set them properly afterwards in the fridge for a couple of hours, and then I like to leave them in a cool, dark place for around 24 hours before serving them to let that flavour infuse and let the shells soften a little to a chewy consistency. And that's it, there you go. The fanciest, Frenchest biscuits in the world. Thanks for watching, everybody, and be sure to check out some of my other videos, especially the Paris ones if you're into that sort of thing. So until next time, Terra.